Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jordan. Thank you very much for um, inviting me here today. Um, last month, the FBI arrested their number one cyber criminal. Uh, he allegedly masterminded a scheme that defrauded the financial industry out of tens of millions of pounds, of dollars rather. They believe $100 million over the, la the uh, last few years. Um, his name was Toby Chai on Wuhara, and not, as was reported on Twitter, Chi on Wuhara, which is my name. Um, so I hope nobody came here expecting a masterclass in cyber crime. Um, I do have some form in this area. Uh, for 23 years, I was a professional engineer building telecoms networks across the world. Uh, not all of them with security built in, I should say, though we soon learned to retrofit it. And as head of telecoms technology at Ofcom, the UK telecoms regulator, I was asked to look at cyber security in, um, I think it was 2006. And I came back with this report which talked about um, tales of bot attacks and honey traps, DDoS and white hat wizards, Trojans and worms, fishing and farming. And I was greeted with understandable skepticism. It was as if I was talking about a war in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> but I knew that it was just a matter of time before cybercrime went mainstream. And unfortunately, I was right. That's why we're here today. Now, the, cyber now the, home of the Cabinet Office believe that cybercrime costs the UK £27 billion a year. Though given that neither the Home Office nor the Justice Department collect statistics on cybercrime, this is extremely difficult to verify. Our world is constantly becoming ever more interconnected. Ericsson estimate that by 2020 there will be 50 billion things connected to the internet. And other analysts put the number of connected devices in the trillions. Now, of course, that interconnectedness represents a huge opportunity for innovation and for businesses, but it also poses a significant and a growing threat. Our national infrastructure, water, gas, electricity, telecoms and the financial services, which are considered part of our critical national infrastructure, they're all linked together and there will be more so in the years to come. And much of it is in private hands. So our policy response must be equally joined up across private and public sector and across the departments of government. And I'm not convinced that government so far is up to meeting that challenge. Last month, we had the National Audit Office's uh, review into the UK cybersecurity strategy, and it highlighted room for significant improvements in leadership and coordination across government. And this has been echoed by the former head of GCHQ and CESG, uh, Nick Help Hopkinson, who said that the UK was lagging behind in our ability to respond to cyber attacks because of a lack of cohesion across agencies. And yet our current cybersecurity policy is based on a figure of 27 billion that few people have any real confidence in and on little or no understanding of how much cybercrime is happening, where and to whom. And I believe you must build policy based on a solid, a solid evidence base. Uh, whilst underreporting is certainly a problem for business, we must work towards a system where we better understand the threats we are facing and how they are evolving. So it, in, my, in response to parliamentary questions that I've put down, the Home Office have said that they don't record cybercrime separately from other crime, and they don't even have an assessment of the costs or benefits of recording cybercrime. So, they don't know what they're not doing and they don't know why they're not doing it. Um, you know, right now we have a 650 million national cyber security strategy up to 2015, which is great, yeah, it's the beginning, but 60% of that goes into the single intelligence account. 
Now, I know that the threat from governments, individuals, and organized crime outside our borders is a huge risk, and events in Korea just uh, this week have highlighted what those attacks can do. But they're not the only cyber threat, and the economic consequences of commercial cyber warfare can be devastating, are being, are devastating. And we have very little from government in explaining exactly where the risks lie and what resources are needed to deal with each of those risks. And even less explanation in how we would respond, who would respond, and how all those with responsibility, various responsibilities work together. So there are 43 police forces in England and Wales, plus numerous agencies and bodies that have an interest in cybercrime. Um, across government, the Home Office, Justice, the Cabinet Office, Biz, all have an interest in cybercrime. And we have to ensure that they're properly coordinated. Um, as John Colley, head of ISE2, said in December, that the government cyber security strategy is too fixated on high-level macro security issues. And given the interconnectedness, and you know, this is cliche, but we're only as secure as our weakest link, um, our strategy has to encompass all levels of threats. So government should be doing more right across the cybersecurity spectrum. So, and when I meet software and technology businesses, um, they're concerned about the growing threat of cyber criminals and our response to that threat. Yet policing, education, as we've just heard, and training got only a fraction of that 650 million cyber security budget. For example, the police got just five million pounds. And at the same time as they're having significant cuts, um, which by the way, the prime minister himself has said that those police cuts should be focused on the backroom boys doing the IT rather on the front line. What the PM doesn't get is that cyber crime is increasingly the front line. Europol recently opened a new cyber crime center, uh, yet the Home Secretary wants to opt out of cross-border cooperation on crime. Small and medium enterprises are the victims of three quarters of all successful data breaches, we estimate, yet the government has no real resources or strategy for supporting small and medium enterprise cyber security. Businesses are suffering from a global shortage of information security professionals. And I heard what was just said about um, the, I the ICT um, GCSE. And anyone, I know it's changing, but anyone who listens to Michael Gove will know he's more interested in teaching Latin than Java. Now, as an ex-software engineer myself, I should say that I'm still a little stuck in C++ and APLL, but that still puts me 2,000 years ahead of the Education Secretary. We have an Attorney General that thinks that tweeting is the same, and I quote, as talking over the garden fence, and a Cabinet Office Minister whose idea of secure disposal is throwing his papers into a central London park bin. So this does not fill me with confidence that ministers across government are on top of the problem, or even, to be honest, understand what the problem is. And there is a chasm in their cyber strategy big enough to drive a GSM network through. Ministers claim their strategy covers mobile devices, but if you read their documents, for example, the update that they published in December, it doesn't mention mobile devices once. We're increasingly bringing our own devices to work. A recent report by HP found that 48% of mobile applications were vulnerable to unauthorized attacks. Actually, I think that's an underestimate. Um, but, and you don't need a crystal ball to see that the internet mobility is growing. And we don't even have a strategy that covers mobile devices. So in opposition, Labour is busy developing our policies. We have, been, we have de been developing the One Nation vision for the UK. 
Now, for cybersecurity, that means real vision and leadership. In future, traditional crime will increasingly be done online. It will be mobile and it will be complex. We need to be prepared to deal with this. We need to understand the threats and have the skills, the resources and the leadership to deal with them. So we must ensure that public services delivered online, like the forthcoming universal credit, are protected from fraud and cyber crime. We must take the lead in bringing industry together to develop the appropriate standards internationally. We must have high profile and authoritative leadership. We must have a government that looks out for everyone and a digitally literate population. Economically, socially and geopolitically, the virtual world is becoming as important and as, com and as complex as the real world. 4,000 years ago, so that's going back even further than Gove wants to, um, the earliest example of law known to historians, it's Babylonian law, stated that the first duty of government is to protect the powerless from the powerful. A Labour government would prioritise making sure our citizens can live safely in cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.